Today, orientation course. Today, we have the topic valuation overview and methodology by our speakers, CA Suchal Shah, sir, and CA Vitang Shah, sir. Uh, before we start our session and go through the uh, pond of valuation, I request our chairperson, Niyati, to uh, highlight a few things to our participants. Over to you, Niyati. Uh, thank you, Chani. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our today's session on valuation overview and methodologies as part of our five-day webinar series on uh, CA Students Orientation course. As we gather here today, I am thrilled to kickstart this enlightening exploration into the world of valuation practices and methodologies. Today's session holds immense significance as we uncover the intricacies of valuation, a critical aspect of financial decision-making for businesses and investors alike. With, uh, with Sujal sir and Vitang Bhai guiding us through this journey, I am confident that we will gain invaluable insights and practical knowledge to navigate the uh, field of valuation with precision and clarity. Our primary aim today is to provide you all aspiring CA students with a comprehensive overview of valuation methodologies, equipping you with necessary tools and understanding to analyze and assess the value of assets, businesses, and investments. Whether you are just a beginning, your journey in the field of finance, or, or you are already well-versed, there is something valuable for each of you to take away from today's session. Once again, I encourage each of you to actively participate, ask questions, and engage with our speakers to make the most of this opportunity. Before we proceed, I would also like to express my heartfelt gratitude to uh, Sujal sir and Vitang bhai for graciously sharing their expertise with us today. Uh, sir, your dedication to advancing knowledge and empowering aspiring CA students is truly commendable and we are honored to have you with us. Without further delay, let us begin our today's session with enthusiasm and curiosity. I wish you all a productive and enlightening experience. Over to you, Chani. Thank you, Niyati, for your insights. Before we start our session, I would request everyone to write their queries in the chat box. Uh, so at the end of the session, we would take up each query. And before starting, I will request Viral Shah. Uh, the convener of the committee to intro formally introduce our speaker and the chairperson chairman thank you charmi uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce two experts from the valuation field today uh, to begin with uh, sujal sir uh, sujal shah is a practicing ca having an experience about 32 years he is a founder partner at ssp and company uh, which is situated in Mumbai and is involved in corporate consultancy practice of the firm. He was a partner of Messrs. NM, Raiji and company till October 2006. His main areas of expertise are financial valuation, business restructuring, family settlements, succession planning and general corporate matters. He has been associated with large uh, corporate mergers. He has authored several papers on the subject of valuations and restructuring. He's a regular speaker at various forums on mergers and acquisitions, valuations, and so on. He was one of the team members involved in drafting the valuation standards of ICA. On the education front, he's a chartered accountant. He's a re registered valuer. He has completed his course on the CSR conducted by ICA on courses on arbitration, mediation, and conciliation from ICA. And he's currently pursuing the certificate course on ECG of ICA. He is the independent director on boards of listed as well as unlisted companies. He is the chairman of advisory committee and member of editorial board of ICI registered valuers organization. And he is an invitee for 2023-24 on the valuation standard boards of ICI. With this brief introduction, uh, we welcome you, Sujal sir. Uh, now, the second speaker of the day, uh, CA Vitang Shah. He is a chartered accountant and a CFA uh, by qualification. He currently works as an associate director and he leads a team of professionals at SSPA and co, -LLP, uh, and co chartered accountants. He has an experience of more than 13 years in business valuation and other financial advisory services. He has carried out valuations for purposes like mergers, demergers, inbound, outbound investments, acquisitions, divestments, open offer, buyback, and the list is long enough. He has been associated with several large corporate transactions. He has carried out financial valuations of well-reputed Indian and multinational companies. 
Prior to joining SSPA, uh, Vitang sir has worked as an analyst with JP Morgan Chase in the asset management division. Uh, Vitang sir is a regular speaker at various seminars and courses of various professional bodies and institutes. He is currently our honorable joint secretary of the Chamber of Tax Consultants for the year 2023-24 and he was the chairman of the students committee of the chamber for the years 21-22 and 22-23. With this brief introduction, uh, I welcome you Vidhan sir. Thank you. Over to you, Charmi. Uh, thank you, Viral, for the brief introduction. So now, now take listen between uh, you and the speakers. Over to you, Suchil, sir. Neyati and uh, Viral for very kind introduction. I am really happy today that I am speaking uh, uh, one big, uh, with the students and secondly uh, under the banner of Chamber of Tax Consultant which is very close to my heart. Uh, I was a president of this August body in year 2010. So uh, Chamber has always been very close uh, to uh, mine. I have learned a lot from Chamber and this is a very small uh, returning back to the chamber and its members, uh, this time particularly the student members. Uh, I'm also very happy uh, that chamber has taken this initiative of uh, introducing new subjects to the student members. Uh, coming to the subject per se, see friends, uh, before we go to the slides, I will very briefly touch upon the subject uh, per se with you on certain overview of the current situation. And then I will uh, request my very, very able colleague uh, Vitang to take over the specifics of methodology and various adjustments and other aspects. And maybe at the end, if required, we can uh, finally sum up with some other uh, comments. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, let us understand what exactly is valuation. When you try to evaluate a worth of a particular item, which could be valuation, which could be a share of a company, it could be a business of a company, it could be an intangible asset of the company. Uh, uh, if you are looking at a tangible asset, this could it could be a plant and machinery or lender building of company of a particular company. So, for variety of purposes, when you are trying to arrive at a worth of a particular item, that is called a valuation exercise. Now, over the years, if you see the history, valuation was considered to be a very niche area of practice and very few chartered accountants uh, entered this field in uh, good old days. You know, you can count on fingertips uh, where uh, professionals ventured into this field of uh, practice. People always thought that this is a rocket science and it requires a very dedicated uh, you know, training. Uh, to some extent, it is true, but to more extent, it is it, it is like a, applying a common sense to the data which is provided to you. Uh, nothing is impossible. If somebody else can do it, we can also do it. This will be remained as a monopoly of chartered accountants, and it continues to be, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, being handled by chartered accountants more in today's world also. Uh, however, once I explain you some of the recent developments, you will know that new and new professionals are entering this field. So, friends, whenever you are you are thinking of selecting an area of practice for uh, as a professional going forward, uh, you may consider this as a very uh, niche area of practice. There is a, a misconception in the mind of many professionals that if I am into valuation field, I don't need to look at taxation or audit or accounting aspect of it. But friends, if you are trying to be in the valuation field, your base will be the financial statements of a corporate entity. And that's where your knowledge about accounting, your knowledge about auditing, your knowledge about the recent tax uh, uh, implications, all this will be very critical. So please don't close your minds and say that if I'm in valuation field, I don't need to look at uh, you know any other area of practice. All areas are very important. All those areas will help you to give a very uh, effective and fair valuation product. So do not ignore other areas of practice while practicing uh, this uh, uh, valuation as your core practice area. 
another point which i would like to also tell uh, and share with my friends is that it is possible that this this may be uh, you know add, add on to your routine practice so suppose you are in audit area or you are lo looking at say taxation uh, as a practice area you may start this in a very small way uh, you know uh, because of your relationship with the client because of the industries at which you will be connected you may add this as one of the additional area to start with and thereafter once the volume grows you may uh, venture it into to the very large scale basis so uh, don't uh, have uh, be under the impression that this is an area which is only a monopoly of few professionals uh, and and others uh, you know will not be able to handle it so uh, i still remember years back one chartered accountant from nagpur had contacted me and he said it was a very relatively small company for which he wanted me to carry out the valuation and when i told him that why don't you only attempt it and uh, he was very reluctant he says it is not possible for me because i have never dealt with as a subject i am i am hardcore into audits and uh, i i remember insisting him that you attempt it and i will go through everything i will guide you through through the entire process it was a very small company based out of nagpur and i am very happy that after almost 20 20 plus years today that firm is one of the most prominent firms in that geography carrying out the valuation of so many companies so there was there is always a beginning so once you you get into a particular field you will know the nuances and uh, you know the qualities which are required to develop this area of practice another important thing before we get into the specific is that if you are in this area of practice you need to have a very good reading of what is happening in the recent times which company is acquiring what other uh, businesses uh, you know tomorrow said there is an article that a particular company is opening a, a, a setting up a factory in east india now you must get into the details why that company needs to be set up in east india is it near to the raw material supply is it helping them to export their goods to the customers what is that reason why they are setting up that factory there and once you get and start analyzing these news items which are which are available in a plenty in the current times you will know what are the objectives these corporates are, are either for buying their uh, company or for setting up a unit or for that example even for selling of a particular uh, business or undertaking to uh, uh, you know in their corporate actions and once you start analyzing this transaction you will develop an interest in the corporate actions and accordingly you will be able to also have uh, added interest in the valuation field because every transaction whether it is a purchase sale merger demerger ultimately finally valuation is the core area of that transaction which will be required because any regulatory authority today before approving the uh, transaction will need a valuation report from a particular uh you know we'll go through the professionals who can do this valuation exercise but uh, you know so uh, requirement of doing valuation is increasing day by day volume is increasing at the same time players are also increasing so one has to now so to as we speak for today we are competing with com company secretaries there is a uh, valuation uh, which is being done by mbas there is, there is a valuation which is done by cost accountants uh, in fact if you are a mcom with a particular years of experience you can still carry out the valuation so there are a whole lot of uh, professionals who got added into this field but at the same time the requirement of valuation has also increased multifold so uh, you know uh, if there is enough on the plate available for everyone uh, there are larger chartered accountant firms or larger valuation firms who who will have a very large transaction on their plate and there are middle level firms who will have that their size of uh, transaction so there is enough uh, volume which is possible to be addressed to and that's why uh, you know as i mentioned earlier this is one area which which everybody can attempt and you you must understand this subject well so that anything which comes on your way as you become professional going forward you will be able to guide your clients you will be able to uh, you know also give your value added services to your clients as against this if you are in industry uh, player in industry that means you are working for an industry you can still be an in house consultant to the promoters or the owners or your managing director when he is exploring a transaction 
to uh, if you know this subject he will he will get that additional benefit from your uh, knowledge uh, uh, you know when they are consuming a particular transaction so this area whether you are in going to be in practice or whether you are going to be in service is going to be very helpful and it will also help you if you have the knowledge of this area it will also help you to rise in an organization if you are serving somewhere very fast as compared to uh, only a professional who is doing with the other uh, area of practice so now uh, uh, if we can go to the next slide uh, vitan please So I, I hope the, it is a, 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 you are able to see it on the screen. But uh, you, you know, I'll also just explain you the landmark events which took place uh, in the profession where you know uh, where it started and where it is today. Uh, you know, till till about 1990, we had hardly any rules on valuation which were available. You know, for a professional. So there was one uh, under the wealth tax rule. There was a, a, a you know requirement to and, and there was a guidance how to value the unquoted shares. And it was a very basic and raw uh, guidance available to the professionals of how to carry out the valuation. Sometime in early 92, uh, you know, when the issue of shares, the pricing aspect was, was uh, you know, made free. Uh, uh, the, the premium about an IPO and other things, there were certain guidelines which were available based on which you can charge the premium for the shares which are required to be issued. Come 1992, when the SEBI was enacted and uh, we had the proper norms uh, for the players, that is equity share, uh, equity uh, uh, brokers, you had uh, governance on the corporates, how to deal with the particular transaction. So lots of changes got uh, you know enacted uh, in 1992. However, at the same time, on the subject of valuation, there was hardly any uh, change which was brought in. Uh, I, I remember when I started my career in 90s, uh, early 90s, uh, hardly any material, even reading material was available. And I, I still remember that somebody was going to London and I requested for a book on valuation. And uh, he had got it from me. And from there, we got a lot of insight uh, on, the, on the subject of valuation because uh, uh, you know, from India perspective, there was hardly any reading material also which was available. Now, if we talk about a decade after that, or maybe two decades after that, uh, specific regulations were introduced, uh, particular under the FEMA. And originally, it started that, you know, all the transaction of cross-border nature, uh, you have to compulsorily carry out the valuation under discounted cash flow method. And uh, my colleague Vitang will tell you what exactly is this method. But just to, uh, you know, give the significance of it, even the Reserve Bank of India used to insist of insist for discounted cash flow method, which up till now, till that date, you know, discounted cash flow method was not favored by the regulators because they always thought till that time that discounted cash flow method uh, predominantly uses the future projections of the company. And that's why projections being prepared by the company could be could be made in such a way to favor the transaction outcome uh, or the valuation outcome so that's where uh, uh, you know by recognizing discounted cash flow method in 2010 by, under the prema guidelines it got a uh, you know good amount of boost uh, for learning for the professional because then everybody started learning this as a uh, very specific methodology of valuation now, by the time of 2010, so our CA Institute also had started a certificate course, I think sometime in 2013 or 12, 12 or 2013. Institute, CA Institute started a dedicated certificate course for its members on valuation. So it was about seven or eight days uh, course, uh, full days, uh, mostly on weekends. And a full, almost all the relevant aspects of valuations were covered in, during those sessions. And at the end of uh, those seven, eight sessions, a brief exam was conducted by the CA Institute and then certificates were awarded to chartered accountants. So uh, that also brought a little more uh, flavor to this area of practice. And uh, many, many chartered accountants, even from non-metro cities, opted to learn this subject first and get the certificate of uh, uh, being a valuer under the CA Institute. 
Now, come 2017-18, which I would consider it as a uh, you know landmark year for valuation as a profession, where uh, the uh, Companies Act related rules, I mean valuation rules and valuation related section were enacted, and uh, you know that was a major turning point. Uh, we could see that you, uh, lots of standardization was being introduced because rules were. Uh, you know, covering the valuation uh, reports, formats of it, how it will be conducted, what kind of disclaimers you can write. Uh, all these were introduced about in 2017-18 and the uh, registration of valuer was made a compulsory event. And that, that, so even if I was a chartered accountant at that time, point of time, say with 25 years of experience in valuation, still I had to undergo an exam pass that exam and then become a registered valuer. So it was a turning point for all the professionals uh, who were practicing value, valuation. And I still remember that first batch which we attended because also it had to go through a 50 hours of training. And we, we were all chartered accountants who were carrying out valuation for more than a decade. And uh, it, it consisted of uh, all the experienced people, but it was a good fun to revisit the theory to learn some new uh, techniques and appear for the exam. Uh, <clears throat> there was a slight uh, change also in 2020, which government had in, uh, introduced a bill, but which, which is not yet enacted, where there was a valuation, valuers bill, which was introduced sometime in April 2020. The intention of this bill was to create a separate institute of valuers, like we have separate institute of chartered accountants, separate institute of company secretaries. The intention is to create a separate institute of valuers under the act itself and uh, govern the valuers, all the types of valuers under one roof. However, till today, this uh, bill has not seen the you know light of the day. Maybe going forward, it, it will become compulsory and we'll see some changes. So this is how the whole profession has evolved over the years. Uh, with our next slide, please. So very briefly, uh, before you go into the specifics about methodologies, I thought it will be relevant for us to understand, uh, uh, you know, what what are some of the important concepts under valuation which we have to keep in mind. Now, to start with, uh, you know, we, there is always a difference between value and price. And let me just give you an example that if I do a fair valuation of a company, and it's a, say for example, the fair valuation comes to rupees 100 per share. It is not necessary that the transactions which are carried out by the buyer, unbiased buyer as well as seller uh, will be done out at always 100 rupees a share. It could be at 110 rupees or it could be at 90 rupees also, depending on the need of the buyer, depending on the distress uh, nature of the seller or any other particular reason why somebody will pay either a premium to the fair value or they will get a discount to the fair value. So to that extent, it is not necessary that in all cases, fair valuation, which we as a chartered account or we as a valuer will work out, will match exactly with the price of the transaction. Uh, another important aspect we have to keep in mind, and this has to be strongly be understood, is that valuation is not an exact science. It is not like a formula-driven thing. Uh, and you know, you 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 give the inputs and it will give a common answer to everything. So for example, if I do a valuation of a company uh, and I arrive at 100 rupees per share, it is not necessary that Vitang who will do the valuation will always come out with 100 rupees per share. It is highly possible that Vitang will work out a value either more than 100 rupees a share or it could be less than 100 rupees a share because valuation involves lots of subjectivity. It is more like an art rather than a specific science. So, uh, uh, you know, like just to give you an example, if it is a discounted cash flow method, the discount rate which I may use could be different than what Vitang may use. Or say if I'm using a multiplication method, that means I'm applying a multiplier to earnings before interest depreciation tax, which is a bit tough. If I'm applying a multiplier to that, my view about the multiple to be applied to that company could be different than that of Vitang's. Uh, 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 what Vitang may choose as a multiple. So that's why valuation involves lots of subjectivity 
so it is not necessary that two valuers attempting the same company's valuation will come out with the same result it is very much possible that they will come out with different results and both of both the valuers could be right so because both are, both will have their justification uh, points another important aspect in valuation is that valuation is a very date specific thing when i say date specific what i mean is that suppose i am carrying out a valuation in the month of say march of 2024 it is not necessary that that valuation will be useful or valid say in the month of april 2024 because between 13th of march 2024 and say 10th of april 2024 an event could have taken place in the company which could have changed the entire profitability cycle or the growth prospects of the company for example there is a serious change in the regulation of the uh, uh, regulation in the business in which the company is operating in that case the entire outlook of the company may change or say for example there is a fire in the company and the plant is shut and it's not likely to reopen for another 4 5 months in that case what valuation i did in march may not be valid uh, when i do the valuation as of april april and i give this classic example to ev in every forum i speak that if i had valued hotel taj in the uh, on say 1st of november 2008 Uh, taj kolaba i mean if i had valued taj kolaba hotel at uh, on 1st of november 2008 uh, whether that same valuation i will continue to say that it holds good even on 30th november 2008 answer will be definitely no in between the two dates an event took place there was a terrorist attack on the hotel and the entire property got damaged nobody knew how many people lost life and how many uh the uh, months it will take for them to restart nobody knew what kind of compensation they will have to pay to the people who lost their lives all sorts of uncertainty prevailed on 30th november 2008 and that's why the valuation of the property or the or the business of taj kolaba just changed within few days so it is a very date specific thing Uh, value value also varies with the situation and let me give you an example suppose i am doing a valuation for the purpose of merger of two companies say company a is merging with company b in that case my methodology will uh, could be different uh, secondly my entire attention will be for relative values of the two companies as against this if i was valuing a standalone value uh, share of well uh, company a i i may use different methodologies i don't need to look at relativity between two companies because i am valuing only one company so depending on the situation my entire valuation methodology or approach may change so these are few concepts which are quite relevant to be understood let's move on now when you when you say valuation of a company you may want to value the securities that means the shares or preference shares or convertible bonds or any financial asset of the company or you want to maybe want to value the business of the company that means not the entire company per se but only a business say for example there is a company which is into cement business as well as pharma business and there is a possibility of a transaction in pharma business then the owners will come and tell the come and uh, request the valuer to only carry out the valuation of a pharma business because that's the subject matter of likely transaction likewise now nowadays intangible assets related transactions are also increasing day by day uh, uh, sale of brand or purchase of certain rights or participating in a patent uh, ownership all these are there for which valuation of intangible has become very important area of practice for the valuer now there apart from this there are also certain other valuers which are valuations which are required which maybe as a as a chartered accountant we will not be able to carry out there are other professors who will do it but nevertheless they are also required to be done in certain circumstances which could be valuation of land and building plant and machinery or items like jewelry paintings or uh, if there are any drawings all these are required to be valued for some specific purpose in that case the people who are expert in that field will get involved and then they will carry out the valuation next slide please now very briefly i will just tell you the recent amendments which came in the companies act where uh, met, uh, section 247 of the companies act was in, uh, uh, you know enacted 
as I mentioned in sometime in 2018. Uh, and that's how the registered valuer concept got introduced. Very couple of important points only I will just draw your attention. If you read section 247.2 of the Companies Act, what, what is expected from a registered valuer is making an impartial, true and fair valuation of assets. This is the first criteria which they have put or first expectation they have given. Second is the valuer must exercise his due diligence while performing the function, function of a valuer. That means your eyes and ears should be open that, you know, whatever is relevant for valuing that company you have captured. Third is valuer should not have a direct or indirect interest, uh, uh, you know, uh, either post carrying out the valuation exercise or companies that also provides that prior to three years prior to carrying out the exercise or your appointment as a valuer. In practical life, this uh, draws up a lot of challenges for valuers because many times, say two years back, you have, you have given some opinion to this company or you have represented this company in the tax tribunal uh, or there is some, some very other small, uh, you know, advisory work which you have done such company. Whether it can be said that you had some interest in that company or there is some conflict which is involved, it is a debatable point. There are different legal firms who are taking different interpretation of this section and this requirement. But most of the value of firms today, as I understand, have taken a conservative view as long as they have no material. That means I, I cannot be auditor of a company and also a value of that company. So people are following mostly the conservative view and, and remaining away from transactions which could have a possible conflict of interest. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned very briefly, what happens now as a uh, as a valuer? Once I pass the exam, I have to get registered with IBBI, which is Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India, which is the government uh, under the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. It comes and every valuer through their own registered valuer organization. So today, if I am a chartered accountant and I am registered with ICAI registered valuer organization, RBO, which is a separate section eight company. In that case, first I will fill up my application after passing the exam with my RBO, which is ICI RBO. Then that will be forwarded to the IBBI by the RBO after they satisfy themselves that the form is properly filled up. And then IBBI after examining their criteria will register you as a registered valuer. If you go through the IBBI website, Insolvency Bankruptcy Board of India website, you will find all registered valuers' names and addresses and contact details all registered. So uh, uh, all of that is now available online <coughs> as far as the IBBI website is concerned. As a registered valuer, you can be part of the firm or it could be an individual also. Uh, only last point before I hand over to Vitang is that institute in the year 2018, and I'm really proud of our institute because we were the first institute in the country or first organization is the, in the country that we came out with our own valuation standards. Till that uh, year 2018, the valuers were following valuation standards, which were coming either from European standards or American standards or Australian standards. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, we were following that. But 2018, <coughs> the CA Institute brought the valuation standard. And Vitang will, <coughs> sorry, Vitang will explain you in detail, the valuation standards. I'm sorry, one minute. <clears throat> and Vitang will touch touch upon those valuation standards which are already notified. But uh, today we are the only institute which has come out with their own standards. Others, uh, you know, institute are still uh, in the process of drafting or waiting for the government to come out with their own standards. But till that time, our evaluation standards remains to be, uh, you know, the only standards approved, uh, uh, you know, as of now for operational purposes. So uh, to that extent, a uh, good uh, level field is available to us. And we are now at a platform where valuation field, uh, which was up till now the monopoly of chartered accountants, we can continue to be, you know, uh, provide the best uh, services under uh, our banner because we have all the requisite qualities, whether it comes to the education, uh, where, where it comes to the training, all of these are imparted and possible to be taken uh, once you uh, follow certain criteria. 
and then we can enter into this field. I will stop here and request Vitang to get into little more specifics of methodologies, adjustments, uh, some examples which he will give. And then if required at the end, I will I, I will again come back with some other views uh, if time permits. Thank you, Vitang. And, uh, you can take over now, please. Thank you so much, sir, for you know giving an overview on the valuation and setting the foundation for the rest of the session. Now, as uh, you know, sir, as just uh, suggested that I first cover with the valuation standards which have been issued by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. So, uh, you know, the reason and the purpose for which you know the valuation standards are in place is because you need consistency. You need that everyone does the valuation in a uniform and a transparent way. Okay, my valuation approach cannot keep on changing for each of the different valuations which I keep on doing. And again, not just me, but everyone within the industry also follows certain consistent standards. Okay, it's always better to have uniformity in approach and that's where the quality of the valuation output is, you know, regulated. So, uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants Valuation Standards, which is the ICI VS, which is it is called, it became mandatory from 1st of July 2018 for all the valuation reports which are issued under the Companies Act 2013. So, if there is any valuation report which is being issued pursuant to a requisite from say, Companies Act 2013, then it is mandatory from 1st July 2018. And thereafter, it is recommended. Uh, that you know you follow the same valuation standards under valuations which are you know coming deriving from income tax SEBI or FEMA regulation and as you know sir has just said that ICI RBO also has adopted the valuation standards which have been issued by ICI now this is broadly you know the valuation standards and how it is there so ICI valuation standards 101 gives you the definition uh, various definitions which are there 102 gives you the valuation basis which could be, you know, what is the basis of the valuation, whether it's a fair value, it's a liquidation value, it's a participant specific value. So what is the basis and accordingly, you know, the approaches have to be followed. Valuation standard 103 talks about the various valuation approaches and the methodologies which are there, which is our subject matter today, which I'll be covering it more in detail. 201 talks about the scope of the work, the analysis which one needs to carry out and how does one evaluate the work which they have done. 202 talks about the basic requirements, which is a must when you are, you know, reporting a valuation. How, how what are the contents which are uh, which should form part of your report, and also the documentation which one registered valuer needs to have it in place, you know, before issuing the report. Section 30, the standard 301 talks about how business valuations are carried out. 302 talks about the intangible assets, how are they to be valued. And 303 talks about the financial instrument. What are the valuation approaches which one needs to consider while valuing financial instruments? Now, now I'll come to the broad purposes from where the valuation gets triggered. So you can do business valuation when there is kind of a restructuring. So as sir gave an example, like if there is a pharma company and a cement company, sorry, if two businesses within the same entity. So, and if you want an investor to come into one of the businesses, you may have to demerge, say, a pharma company from a cement company and a pharma company together so that the investor can invest only and be part of your only one of the businesses, which say may be pharma business. So there are other ways and means, you know, wherein you can restructure, wherein two companies could amalgamate together to form a larger business. So that's where when you are doing a restructuring, a business valuation gets triggered. When there is a purchase or a sale of shares or business, that's where entities would like to know and evaluate what is the value of the business which they are acquiring or they are selling. At times, there are a lot of litigations or which happen wherein you know there is some dispute regarding some transaction or there are some family settlements wherein you know there are a family wherein there are a lot of brothers and you know it's a decided that few of the businesses will be allocated to few of the brothers. So which is the entity or your main business? How is that valued? How is the residual business valued? So that, you know, at the end of the day, all the three brothers or all the brothers within the family get equal share in terms of uh, the businesses that they will be owning and continuing the business going forward. So there may be some plus or minus in terms of one brother may have to give uh, another brother some consideration because the business which he is going to inherit will be a larger business 
you know so that's where each of the businesses may have to be valued separately when you are raising funds for any of your businesses uh, you know you may have to assess what is the value at which you know uh, the shares or the stake is going to be issued to the investor obviously when you do such transaction there are a lot of regulations in india which you know regulate uh, the valuation at which uh, the shares are issued or transacted at so one of the main one is fema which comes into play wherein there is a foreign currency involved in the transaction so say if there is a money that the foreign currency which is coming in india or going out of india at that time there are regulations in place which are there by fema wherein the transaction should not happen at a price lower than the price which is suggested by a chartered accountant or a merchant banker where the foreign currency is coming in india and when it's outbound investments you know the shares are issued at a price not lower than not higher than the price which a ca recommends then there is an income tax regulation uh, say specifically say section 56 with uh, 27b to 56 to 10 which talks about the shares which are being issued by a company or there is a transfer of shares amongst shareholders or to a resident or a non resident that what should be the minimum price at which the the shares should have been issued by the company then if the company is listed there the uh, there are several regulations which needs to be followed that if supposedly there are uh, as there is an open offer or there is a delisting offer uh, you know what should be the minimum price at which the the offer should be made companies act comes into play when there is a say a issue of shares by the company so that the shares need not be issued at a price lower than the price which is uh, suggested by a registered valuer so these are all various regulatory requirements you know from where the valuation may trigger the need for a valuation may trigger when do you value an intangible so if there is a purchase or a sale of an intangible so this may happen for example if you are the brand is one of your major value drivers for a business so in in that case an intangible being a brand is valued wherein it is bought by one of the companies thereafter it acquires the right to use that brand and sell the products thereby so that's where you value only the brand which is getting transferred and not the business per se and there are a lot of other intangibles which can be valued this is just one of the example so intangibles requirement comes when there is a purchase or a sale lot of companies hypothecate such intangibles say a brand with banks and thereby they avail loans on those intangible assets so that's where an intangible is valued when you do a business acquisition okay or there is a merger and there is a purchase price allocation which needs to be done at that time the intangible assets for which the payment is made has to be accounted in the books of the transferee company or the acquirer and that's where intangible needs to be valued when there are intangibles you know you have accounted in the books by way of such transactions those are also tested for impairment so that's where intangible asset valuation is again required now with indas coming into play there is lot of financial reporting which happens not only at fair value wherein all the investments or the uh, you know can be fair valued as on each reporting date further as as i referred earlier that purchase price allocation is something wherein there is a slump sale transaction or a merger wherein the assets are being acquired the accounting you need to do purchase price allocation when there are private equity or venture capital funds and they come out with their navs they need to fair value all of the underlying investments so that's where a valuation requirement comes from the private equity and the venture capital funds financial instruments when those are being issued or being accounted you need to do the valuation of those and as i just mentioned at the start the indas reporting requires fair value measurement or for testing of impairment at that point in time so that's again a area wherein you know this the trigger point for the need for a valuation so what is the process which one needs to follow if you have to do a valuation you first need to obtain the information and second is the most critical wherein you need to understand the business which you are valuing many a times we just start move uh, start looking at the financials and just look at the excels at how the numbers are growing how the revenue is growing how the margins are impacted but they never get into more into the detail about the business that where is the raw material being procured from whether it is imported or whether it is dependent on only on few of the customers who are the end buyers for your product 
how are they impacted by any of the industry or the government regulations or any such thing so when you refer to as business understanding it's not restricted only to what business is is it into it's more a level down wherein one needs to get into the you know uh, the business modalities that how exactly is the business being performed and then that's the point after which you move on to the analysis of the data say supposedly you have understood the business that it has a capacity of say 100 metric tons whether in the uh, whether the company can project a further growth after having reached a 100% capacity utilization so that can happen only with further capex being incurred for the increasing the capacity that is called as the expansion capital expenditure so those can be understood and evaluated only first once you have understood the business you need to have a lot of discussions with the management to understand what exactly is the company is into how do they plan to grow the company and how and and all the factors which are associated with the business after you have had the information you have analyzed the data that's where you start the valuation then basis you know the industry in which it is how impacted is it from the market parameters whether it is a listed company it is an unlisted company what are the transactions which are happening in that industry at what multiples basis all of that you then determine the valuation method and and apply it for your company being evaluated and then it's not necessary that you arrive exactly at a single value but you need to also do a lot of sensitivity check on each of the critical factors which may affect the projections or the profitability of each of the company being valued once you have done that you may arrive at a value under different approaches which i'll just cover which is the marketing from market income and the cost approach and then based on the business or the industry in which the company is you assign weights to each of the value which you have arrived at and you recommend a value and that value is recommended via a report which needs to be a speaking report wherein entire procedure which a valuer has adopted right from analyzing the company to the value which he is recommending how he has analyzed the data what is his recommendation why has he chosen a valuation methodology and what has he uh, considered in each of the valuation methodologies, the parameters, those all things needs to come out in the report. So these, this is the you know, broad steps in terms of how a valuation needs to be carried out. So what are the various sources of information basis which the valuation is carried out? First is the historical data, which is the audited or the provisional results of the company. Then the industry and the company overview. It's not necessary to... Uh, just look at the company information, but at the same time, it is absolutely a must to have an industry knowledge about the company too, that how the industry is moving and how the company is moving vis-a-vis uh, -vis the industry. Then the, the financial projections which are provided by the management, that is one of the sources which is required for your income approach valuation because your historical data is based on the past which has happened but your financial projections are based the outlook for the industry and the company. Then comes the management discussion wherein a lot of information is obtained when you discuss with the company's management. Then there are listed companies wherein you know the stock market quotations are available in terms of at what price uh, and what volume the, the transactions are happening. There are a lot of information in terms of the company making regular announcements of how the business has evolved not only through quarterly statements but also through investor presentation, announcement of significant business transactions which they may have carried out. Then publicly available data on comparable companies that, that may not necessarily be listed companies, but unlisted companies which are reported on many financial websites, you know, sharing information about transactions even in an unlisted company. Then there are market surveys and newspaper reports which keep on updating you about various transactions, not, uh, transactions and the industry. And the last one is the representation by the management wherein they confirm that the information which a valuer has seen has been provided to them in this uh, representation letter, basis which the valuation report is issued. So these are the broad sources from where the information is obtained. Once the information is obtained, one company, one must look at the SWOT analysis of the company. They should understand the business. They should do the analysis of the industry vis-a-vis -vis the company. There are a lot of regulations in India and there may be policies which may be affecting a specific company and an industry. Say, for example, you are into a 
manufacturing of a drug for which the price is regulated. Okay, so you can't increase the price for that for drug even if you know uh, there is a scarcity in the market because that there is a regulation uh, or a legal framework which stops you from increasing the price. So that's where you need to also check that if the client has projected that the business will grow and they will be able to increase the price, whether that is within the limits which have been set by the regulators. Once you have done a SWOT analysis, you will be in a better position to understand whether the growth which is projected uh, can be achieved by the company, whether it has that capabilities, whether it has that strength to achieve those projections. You do the analysis of the profitability wherein you compare your past and you look at the future. You do, there are a lot of ratio analysis which gives you a broad sense about, you know, there are times wherein the accounts do not necessarily reflect very truly. So at that time, you may see a receivable number which could be very high for all the years. So that tells you that, you know, there could be a lot of uh, receivables which could be outstanding for more than a year or so or two years or three years and those have not yet been written off. So whether those kind of, and, and how quickly are they able to get, uh, you know, the receivables recovered or the, how often do the creditors needs to be paid? So those are all the analysis one, which one needs to do. Then, as I said, when you do the analysis for the uh, projected period, you need to look at the capacity which is there for a company, to what extent it is utilized. You do the analysis of the revenue and expense and try to check that uh, whether the company has been very aggressive in terms of their revenue as, uh, you know, projections and the expenses. And then that's where you try to compare it with the past and question the management to give them the un uh, underlying justification for each of the assumptions that they have considered in the projections. You look at the capacity expansion, uh, whether it is needed and at what cost can the increased capacity come in. It is in which location, whether all the expenses have been budgeted. And thereafter, once it is complete, only thereafter, the revenue increase has been considered. And it's not necessary that once you have a, a new factory which has come up, it will operate at 50, 60, 100% immediately. It may take its own time to utilize that facility. You also need to check thoroughly the working capital requirement which is there for the company and alternate scenario analysis or sensitivity is required so as to just check that how dependent is the company on e on few of the critical scenarios which or the factors which affects the valuation. It's only thereafter that you know you start the valuation. So which are the various valuation methodologies? So it falls under three approaches. The first being the income approach. Under income approach comes only one method, which is the discounted cash flow method, which is based on the future projections of the company. Under market approach, you have three methods, namely the market price method, wherein the price is derived from the quotations which are there in and the price at which you know that shares have been transacted on recognized stock exchange. If, if those shares are not listed, uh, if you're valuing an unlisted company, you can consider the comparable company's multiple method, wherein if the company is an unlisted company, you apply a multiple at which comparable companies are trading in stock market. You apply those multiples to your own company and that's where you arrive at the value under market approach. And the third one being the comparable transactions multiple. So as I just referred to that, there are a lot of unlisted companies wherein a significant stake is being transferred or investments are being made in those unlisted companies by say private equity or venture capital or some other investments are uh, or in being carried out by other investors. So when those are reported, you get a lot of information regarding the price, the multiple at which those transactions have concluded. So those multiples can be applied to the subject company which you are valuing. Then comes the cost approach, which talks about the net assets value method. Net assets value is nothing but a balance sheet position as on a specific date. So that is something which is broadly referred to as the equity share capital plus the reserves and surplus, which is your net asset value. This forms the bare minimum, the basic value ideally for an operating company. Because if one was to uh, uh, consider a liquidation of that company, after reducing the liquidation cost, maybe to in that extent, the company should be able to realize at least the net asset value. But then this and the other approach is the replacement value or the realizable value method. Wherein today, if one was to replace or recreate that asset 
in today's term what should be the price or the cost which one would have to incur to arrive and to arrive at that same facility which is created obviously subject to certain depreciation because the facility would have been used for say few years number of years so in its current position what should be the cost which one would have had to incur so this is not generally cost approach is generally not used for valuing operating companies and that to an asset light company it is more to do with companies which are into liquidation or which are uh, investment holding companies or those are very asset heavy companies and uh, you know it makes sense to look at uh, those companies and you want to acquire them so that you have don't have to incur that pain to uh, go through the entire time period of creating such a facility but this cost approach broadly acts as a cross check in terms of the bottom or the minimum approach minimum value however the income approach and the market approach are the more widely used valuation approaches now i'll first start with the income approach under income approach as i said it's the discounted cash flow method and how do you value a company basis the discounted cash flow method so the business is valued based on a cash flows which are expected over a period of time generally a five year projections are considered wherein the management estimates the business in the industry and specific to their company over the next five years anything more than five years is something maybe just an you know extrapolation of a data but at least till five years the companies do have a vision in terms of what could be the factors which could be impacting their business and the the important thing about dcf method is that it considers the cash flow and not the accounting profit because in book in accounting profit is different from the cash flows which one company generates because there are in cash in accounts there are a lot of non cash charges which are there say for example depreciation which may be a very heavy cost so this is something to do with what is the cash at the end of the day which a company generates and the valuation is based on that the value of a business is aggregate of the discounted value of the cash flows for an explicit and a perpetuity period that means that over the next 5 years if the company has projected some cash flows the present value of that is the value of an explicit period and at the end of the 5 years the company is not going to shut down or discontinue its operations and therefore comes the perpetuity value and why do we discount the cash flows for for each of the perpet uh, explicit and the perpetuity period is because any value in future is not equivalent to value today so 10 rupee or 100 rupee value tomorrow is not necessarily 100 today it has to be something lower than that so how do you arrive at the value today is this is using the discounting factor how to determine the discounting factor will be covered gradually and at the end of 5 years the company is not going to stay constant or the profits are not going to remain constant there will be a growth which will happen every year wherein the company grows so what is the terminal growth rate which one needs to consider when one uses discounted cash flow method is also what is necessary under a discounted cash flow method in dcf method there are broadly two approaches or two ways to arrive at a value one is the free cash flow to equity and the second is a free cash flow to the firm so what do you mean by what is the difference between an equity value and a firm value so in equity it is the value which is there at the end only for equity shareholders however when you refer to the value for the firm which is also called as an enterprise value is nothing but value for equity shareholders plus the debt providers so those debt holders could be the the banks which could have provided the loans it could be the ncds it could be uh, you know other lenders say preference share capital so how do you distinguish between the two and how do you value the businesses so when you are using a free cash flow to equity approach all your cash flows should be discounted using the cost of equity which is the expected return which an equity shareholder would expect at the same time the cash flows which needs to be discounted should be the cash flows only pertaining to the equity shareholders so that means whatever is the profits after having paid 
the interest or the repayments to the debt holders, the residual cash flows needs to be discounted at the cost of equity, which is the expected return which an equity investor would expect. However, when you uh, when you follow the free cash flow to the firm approach, the cash flows which are discounted are the cash flows before paying anything in terms of the interest or the debt repayments or additional loans which a company takes. So it's any in it's any transaction between the company and the debt holders, those all have to be ignored. So it's a free cash flow to the firm and those are discounted basis the weighted average cost of the capital, which is nothing but a cost of equity plus the cost of debt at which the company borrows. And it's weighted according to the capital structure mix of the company. I'll come to each of those two separately in the next slide. So what are the basic parts and how do you arrive at a cash flow for the company? So what are the various factors? First, you need to have a business plan in place wherein the cash flows are projected. And those are projected basis the business cycle in which which economic cycle is the company in? You consider the working capital cash flows. Once you have arrived at the cash flows for the business, you reduce the work incremental working capital which may be required. You reduce the capital expenditure which a company needs to incur. The depreciation and amortization being non-cash expenditure items needs to be added back. However, on those profits, there has to be a tax outflow. So those needs to be reduced. So the main cash flow components are the profits, the cash outflow, which will happen on account of three other factors, which is working capital, the capital expenditure and the tax. How do you determine the weighted average cost of capital? So weighted average cost of capital is nothing but a cost of debt and a cost of equity weighted according to the capital structure mix of the company. So KD refers to the cost of debt, which is nothing but the weighted average rate at which the company borrows the debt. So say that could be today, maybe nine to 10%. And that is, and, the, and what is cost of equity? The cost of equity is nothing but an equity expectation from an, uh, from a return expectation from an equity investor. That is, derived basis the CAPM model, which is capital asset pricing model method, wherein his minimum return expectation is risk-free rate. Because if he is taking the risk of investing into any business or an equity, he will expect something more than the risk-free rate of return by investing in the government bond. Because government bonds are assumed to be that they are never default. So since that is the minimum return which one can get, but he will ask for something more because he is investing in a, he is taking the risk of investing in a company which is not government backed. So how do you then add a premium? So you then look at the equity risk premium, which one expects over and above the risk free rate. How do you derive at an equity risk premium? There are various ways, but broadly one can look at how the the sensex or, a, or an index has returned right from inception till this date or during the past 20 30 years so had you taken an equity exposure right at the start of your uh, the date and which the index got notified what is the return which one has got till this date so today you may find that uh, the the sensex would have returned approximately 14% compounded year on year right from the base index level at which it was started maybe in 1979. So that's where it gives, tells you that today you expect something which is more than a risk free rate. So 14% being the return from the Sensex less the risk free rate which is there maybe at around 6.5-7%. Today it is at 7.5%. So 6.5% is something which is your equity risk premium which is arrived as a return from market less the risk free rate. So that is the equity risk premium. However, not all industries are growing at the same pace in the market. So there are certain companies which grow at a higher rate and some at a lower rate. So the beta is the factor which tells you that how sensitive is the industry to the Sensex. So at times we have seen that the index would have gone on a specific day 
up by 2%. However, few of the companies would have gone up only by 1%. At the same time, when the index falls by 2%, the industry or the those specific industry stocks would have fallen only by 1%. So that tells you that the industry in which your company is, is broadly at a 0.5 times the, it, it is, point, it is 0.5 times the index at which it is moving. So the beta factor for such companies is 0 0.5. So you, multi, you, you start with the risk free rate, you add beta times the equity risk premium. That's how you arrive at the cost of equity. Now, once you have had the cost of equity, you do nothing but weight the cost of equity and the debt according to the capital structure mix. And that's how you arrive at the weighted average cost of capital. There are times when, you know, uh, the company would not have borrowed debt on a specific date. So how do you look at possibly the cost of debt would be if they are, they have certain uh, borrowings which are planned in future and they would have availed such facility, but the money is not yet borrowed. So they can look at uh, the borrowings at which the rate has been confirmed. If, if those companies are, the debt is not, you know, they're not recent, they can look at companies, uh, you know, with similar credit rating and apply, you know, the cost of debt of those specific companies uh, for the companies for which the debt is not recently available. Now, each of these cash flows, which I just referred to, the cash flows for the explicit period and the perpetuity value are both discounted using the discounting factor, which is the weighted average cost of capital to arrive at the enterprise value. So this is an example, you know, a snapshot of how a DCF valuation method would look like. So you start with the operating profits before tax. Why do we use the word operating is because when you value a business, you will exclude any non-operating, non-recurring kind of items. So when you are referring to the operating profit, it excludes any investment income or any one-off type incomes, which is not expected to be earned over the future, or it is not pertaining to the main core business, which you are valuing. Investment income, interest, uh, interest on fixed deposits or dividend from investments. The company, if it is not into the business of investments or investing business, then those are all non-operating business. So when you are valuing a company, you will consider only operating profits. To arrive at the EBITDA, you add the interest and the depreciation. So that means you are using a free cash flow to the firm approach because interest which is paid to the debt holders has been added back. So the, the cash flows which you are discounting will lead you to the value of the firm, which is enterprise value. So from this operating profits and you add the depreciation because it is a non-cash expenditure. So once you have arrived at EBITDA, you reduce the other three components, which we just referred to, which is the capex, which is the capital expenditure, the incremental working capital requirement, which as and when the business grows, there will be more and more money, which will be or getting blocked in working capital. So the incremental working capital needs to be reduced and the tax outflow on account of the profits, which one company earns. After you have reduced the outflows, you arrive at the free cash flows. And I, over here, I have, for simplicity, I've assumed three years of cash flow, but the business is not going to shut after 2026. So that's where the cash flows of the last year being the year on which you have the projections, that is the end of your explicit period. You grow that, you consider a growth rate for those cash flows, which is called as the terminal growth rate. Generally, the growth rate has to be mapped not only with the company's performance in the past, but also with the industry and the nature of the business which it is. However, this cannot grow at a rate which could be much different from the GDP expectation growth rate for the country or the uh, geography in which the business is more, uh, you know, related to. Because we are talking about not only the next few 5, 10, 15 years, we are talking about perpetuity. And generally, over a perpetuity period, this means a very long extended period of time, the growth of the company is more or less in line with the uh, growth rate at which the economy grows at. So that's where uh, for service companies or such companies, the growth rate is generally higher. However, for asset heavy companies, the generally the growth rate is little lower. 
However, the companies which have started, uh, which are just a new startups or something, the perpetuity growth rate could be higher because over the next few years, the company would not have fully considered the growth potential of, uh, uh, you know, the business or the company. That's where a higher growth rate could be considered. So once you have considered a perpetuity growth rate, how do you arrive at the capitalized value for the uh, business is nothing using a formula, which is the Gordon's growth rate model, wherein the cash flow of the last year is divided by the difference between the VAC, which is the discounting factor and the terminal growth rate. So in this example, we have 13% as a discounting factor and 5% being the terminal growth rate. So that means 435 being the last year's cash flow, you divide it by 13 minus 5, which is 8%. So 435 divided by 8%, you will get 5709. So 57 crores is the value of the company at the end of your explicit period. However, that is not a value today. So you will have to bring it down to today's term. So that's where a 0.69 discounting factor, which is the discounting factor for the third year, your last year of your projections, gives you 39.57 crores. And the sum of your cash flows, present value of your cash flows for 24, 25, and 26, plus your perpetuity value gives you an enterprise value of 48.55 crores. As I said, this is an enterprise value, which is your value for both equity and debt holders both. So from this value, you reduce all your outstanding loans, preference share capital, as on a specific date, which is nothing in this example, but 31st December 23, which is your base balance sheet year, you add your surplus cash and value of investments because the, the value above is only pertaining to the value of the business, operating business. It doesn't consider the investment income from your, uh, say, in, interest or your uh, dividend income from your investments. So all of it is considered as a surplus and a value is added separately because of the if someone acquires uh, the equity shares of the company, they also get, along with the value of the business, the cash and the investments which the company possesses as on a specific date. There are certain liabilities which are not accounted in the accounts, which are in the nature of contingent. And that's where an analysis is also done in terms of which are the liabilities which are contingent enough and what is the probability of those liabilities actually devolving on the company. So once you have considered a probability weighted contingent liability, that also needs to be reduced over here. That's where after making all of these adjustments from your enterprise value, you arrive at an equity value for the shareholders. Those divided by the outstanding number of equity shares gives you value per equity share. I'll just take a pause over here. And if in case there are any questions which are there, uh, I'll take it right now before I move on to the other valuation, of course. So, uh, Charmi, are there any questions right now? Uh, yes, we have two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first question is, can you elaborate upon the different methods of valuation? So, I think so. I have already elaborated. I think that, that question was posted before you went into the slide of methodology. So, I believe that is already covered by you. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And the second question is, uh, could uh, sir, could you explain comparable transaction multiple methods again with an example? Okay, so let me just give you an example regarding comparable transaction multiple. In in the cement industry, you find that a lot of articles wherein you would need in newspaper or it is being re uh, reported online nowadays that the company was acquired at a valuation of say $200 per ton as the capacity. So that means that the value of the company at which the transaction has happened, you divide it by the operating capacity of that company, you arrive at a specific value per ton. Now that is the rate at which you will consider and apply it to, to the capacity of your company's uh, manufacturing capacity. So. If $200 per metric ton is the derived transaction multiple, that's how you apply that $200 rate to the capacity of your company being evaluated. So that so it's not necessarily, so there various businesses or industries 
operate at different transaction multiple uh, par transaction parameters if you have something like a hotel industry you have value per room key right so if that could be in the range of 4 crores to 5 crores for a 5 star company and it could be lower for a 3 star or a 4 star company uh, 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 three star or a four star hotel company. Then you have the likes of uh, the steel industry or the hospital industry, wherein you know the valuation is based on value of number of beds which the company has. So those are all the transactions which are derived from transactions which are the multiples which are derived from the transactions which are happening and being derived from those unlisted transactions. I think so. There are other questions also. Which yeah. Talks... Uh, the next question is. One okay, second. so I'll just read it, Sami. So that's not. Sure, sure, sure. For the cost of debt, interest rate changes every year. Bank charges rate as repo rate plus something which is plus rate desired by bank. How we calculate interest rate in that scenario where we borrow loan from banks? So it is the rate at which you borrow the uh, bor uh, the rate. So when you're doing the valuation today, say you are doing the valuation as on 15th of March, the rate at which the borrowing is there today, that is the rate which you need to consider. Plus, if you are going to consider an additional borrowing, increased borrowing later on for your expans uh, expansion capex or something, the rate at which the borrowing or the funding is going to happen for your future funding also, you have to consider that. And obviously the rate of interest keeps on changing. So does every other parameter. But since the valuation is being done on a specific date, which is your valuation date, the interest rate and every other parameter needs to be subject to the date. Uh, the parameter needs to be subject to the valuation date on which you are doing. How to calculate capitalized value of perpetuity? Can you again, can you please explain it once again? So I'll just tell you, if you are aware of the Gordon's growth, formula it states that value for the cash flow or oh, the dividend uh, value which you see over here you have to look at it the cash flow which is there for each, each year is 4.35 crores 435 lakhs you divide it by the VAC minus the growth rate which is your perpetuity growth rate so the discounting factor over year of 13 percent is your VAC minus the terminal growth rate of 5 percent so which is 13 minus 5 gives you 8 percent so 435 lakhs, you divided by 8% will give you 5709 crores. So this is the value of the company at the end of your explicit period. So that's how you arrive at the capitalized value. So that means that 435 lakhs will be my each year's cash flow, which will grow at 5% every year. If those are your cash flows, then the value of that company is 435 divided by 8% will give you 57 crores and 9 lakhs. I think so. Those are the questions which are there in the chat box right now. So I'll just move ahead to the other approach, which is the market approach. So under the market approach comes the market price method, which evaluates the value on the basis of the price at which the transactions are quoted. This is the prudent way to, you know, uh, arrive at a value for a listed company because there are actual transactions which are happening on a stock exchange on a, every specific day. And you generally tend to consider a volume weighted average price rather than any specific single day's close price. Okay. Because during the day, the, the transactions could have happened at different different prices but what matters is the price at which the maximum volume has happened so you try to look at the value which is the volume weighted average price which tells you that more significant or more weightage to the value at which the transaction happened to the transactions wherein the volume was larger okay so that takes away the significant or the unusual fluctuations in the market prices. At the same time, there could be some companies wherein there is very low floating stock in the market. So the stocks are very thinly traded or those turn out to be dormant, wherein the volume is very infrequent. So generally, if the volume for a company is less than 10% of the outstanding share capital during an entire year, 
then those are generally classified as thinly traded companies. So since you know not even 10% of the share capital gets traded during an entire year, the transactions at which the uh, you know the price at which the transactions are carried out on stock exchanges may not necessarily be that relevant. And that's where you can tend to ignore or give lower weightages to the prices under market approach. However, you know, when there are regulatory bodies which actually look at the market price and give importance to that, those are, you know, uh, transactions wherein there is a preferential allotment, there is a fixed formula. When there is a takeover, there is a fixed formula that the price cannot happen at a price lower than, uh, say, the volume weighted average price over the past 10 days or 90 days, whichever is higher. So there are, uh, you know, a lot of significance is given to the market price uh, you know, by SEBI in terms of the various transactions which fall under SEBI regulations. So I, I, as I was just giving you an example, if you look at the volume which is there on National Stock Exchange, it is around 2 crore shares during a period which you would have thought of. Say, supposedly, I am considering a one-month volume weighted average price. The volume on NSC, National Stock Exchange, is 2 crores. However, during that same period, on Bombay Stock Exchange, the volume is only 1.6 crores. The, the price at which the volume weighted average price for NSC is 98 and it is 100 rupee in BSE, you will tend to consider 98 as the value under market approach because that is the exchange wherein the volume is higher and the volume weighted average price of 98 is generally considered. So the, how do you arrive at a volume? How do you calculate the volume weighted average price? So you look at an example over here, wherein during the past six months of April to September 23, you get to see the volume being there in column volume and the turnover means the price at which those shares have been transacted during that month. You do a summation of the, the prices and the volume during that same period. So 2.65 crores, you divide it by 1.26 lakhs, you will get a value per share of INR 210. So that is the volume weighted average price for a company during a six months period. Any questions or any clarity needed, you may just put it on the chat box. I'll just pause over there and take, so take those questions also. <laughs> now you come to the comparable companies multiple method or the comparable transaction multiple method. <laughs> Sorry. So under CCM method, it involves valuation from multiples which are derived from market prices of comparable listed companies. So say for example, you have a company which has an EPS of 5 rupees. However, the market price per share is 100 rupees. So that means it is trading at a multiple of 20. 20. <laughs> Sorry. means that company is trading at a P multiple of 20 times. So that's where you derive the multiple from the transactions which are there of listed companies which are comparable to your business. Similarly, when you go for comparable transaction multiple, that means you look at the deals which may be of listed or unlisted companies and you divide, you, you arrive at the transaction multiples from those unreported or reported companies which may not be which may be listed or unlisted and you consider those transaction multiples and apply it to your company the 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 comparable companies multiple or the transaction multiple method is generally used for unlisted companies because those are the ones for which you may not have market price uh, you cannot follow market price method under market approach because the equity shares of that company are not listed so how do you do valuation under ccm or the ctm method to identify a set of comparable companies or the transactions. So you need to look at where your business is, what exactly are your products, which are the comparable companies which are listed, which are similar to you. Once you have selected the company, you do the computation of the multiples, say the profit multiples, the revenue multiples, or the transaction multiples, basis the industry parameter. Once you have done that, you do a comparison of the company which you are valuing in terms of the parameters which are there for your company and the listed one, then you may have to suitably adjust the multiple because the subject company which you are valuing is an unlisted company 
So it may not necessarily transact at the same multiple at which a listed company uh, trans, uh, is traded at. And that is mainly not only to do with the size of the company, but also for the fact that it is illiquid. So tomorrow, if you want to sell a share of Reliance, you can just at a click of a button, sell the share. However, for selling a share of Reliance Private Limited, you may have to find a suitable buyer who may be interested into buying a share of Reliance Private Limited. So that's where you adjust for multi uh, adjust the multiples of listed company for the factors relating to your subject company, which could be for factors like the size, the geographic presence, the illiquidity, and many such other factors. Once you have done that, you apply that multiple to the profit parameter or the relevant parameters basis which you have computed the multiple. That's how you derive the value under the CCM method. <clears throat> so these are the va various comparable companies multiple approach which one can consider. So if you have to look at earnings based multiple, those could be EV EBITDA or EV revenue, which is enterprise value to EBITDA or enterprise value to revenue. Then comes the P multiple, which is the equity value. And for asset based approach, you, you consider book value multiple to arrive at the equity value. So, so uh, asset based approach are generally considered say maybe for the NBFC companies wherein you know how, how large is their <coughs> how large as the assets which they are managing. You try to consider a book value approach, book value multiple to the assets which that company is managing rather than the profitability at which they operate. Uh, so that's how you arrive at the uh, book value multiple for such companies. Based on, you know, market multiples of listed companies, you know, which could be PE multiple, EV beta multiple. At times you may find that the subject company which you are valuing is a bit negative also because of many uh, reasons. Maybe it could be just in its initial phase or, you know, uh, there are some reasons why, you know, it has been incurring losses today. So how, whether you will not value that company, the answer is no. You can then consider EV revenue multiple for such companies, uh, assuming that the revenue multiple at which uh, the comparable companies are being transacted at. You, uh, you know, the margins could be reached in the, at a future date to that levels. However, today it is loss making, but at the same time, it has been earning that revenue. So that's where you consider EV revenue multiple. And I was referring to, you know, uh, certain specific industries have comparable transactions being recorded as per the industry specific multiple, which is EV per ton for cement manufacturing companies, EV per bed for hospital companies. EV per room keys for hotel business, EV per tower for telecom tower companies, percentage to AUM for asset, man asset management companies. So these are certain various others industry specific multiples which one can apply, you know, uh, under comparable companies multiple approach. Now these multiple needs to be applied on maintainable profits. So how do you arrive at a maintainable profit? You take the per performance of the company for the past years you eliminate any material non-recurring or non-operating items. So those could be either income or expenses. You adjust for the capacity related uh, parameters. So say supposedly today, a company in for nine months, it operates at a capacity uh, of 100, but thereafter it has incurred a additional capacity. And now the profits are going to double because of that new capex with the company has incurred. So then the enhanced profitability with the capex now being concluded, what is the additional profitability which the company will earn because the, the capex is already incurred, you have orders in place and the company will operate at an enhanced capacity at a future level. So that's where the incremental profits which will be earned from the new capex which has been built up needs to be added. And at times, you know, uh, you the recent past may not necessarily reflect the future. You need because there could be an industry cycle which could affect the business of the company. So then generally valuers tend to take an average of the past profits of the company for companies. Uh, and that could be weighted, you know, being more weighted to the recent years because those are more reflective of the uh, business today. And that's how uh, you arrive at a weighted average maintainable profit. The multiples obviously are uh, basis the historical uh, uh, you know profits of the company 
and the part however it also considers the fact that there could be some growth which could be coming from the company's profitability that's where the multiples do consider the historical performance of the company for and also the growth potential of the company it it needs to be adjusted for various other parameters which i have already suggest, uh, stated at the start it should be adjusted for the size so higher the size more stabilized are the operations and therefore it enjoys a, a, a good multiple but however if you are lower in size you know there are more risk attached to the company in terms of being dependent on few customers or something like that that's where you uh, end up taking a discount to the multiple from your peer listed companies it could be location specific a company could have a pan india presence wherein the subject matter of your company could be uh, operating only in say western region or maybe only in one or two states so then the business is affected to that expect uh, for some geographical restrictions and thereby uh, it enjoys a discount to the multiple of your peer listed company uh, higher the market share you are more dominant in terms of your trading policy you can uh, you know uh, authorize a certain increase in a price over a few years because you have kind of a sizable market share so those companies generally enjoy a certain premium and how a perf company is performing vis-a-vis -vis the peer also affects the multiple for the company if you have been able to uh, perform well in terms of your margin or your growth as compared to the industry such growing companies better mar performing companies efficiently performing companies those do enjoy a certain higher multiple as compared to the other peers so once everything is you know considered this is how the approach under the valuation under ccm method is arrived at wherein if you look at it 2021 uh, uh, ebitda of the company was only 3.84 crores however in 22 and 23 it has earned a ebitda of 5.35 and 5.56 so that's where you know when the company is operating at a profitability level of around five and a half crores in the past two years you would wait you, you can average the two rather than considering the third year in an average of 3.84 crores because that maybe was impacted for some other reasons or there could be some increased capacity or some efficiency steps have been taken whereby the profits have improved so weightage is given to the latest years of uh, 22 and 23 once you have weight, uh, it's a simple average which has been considered over years so you arrive at 5.46 crores and an industry multiple of 11.3 is arrived at basis which a uh, enterprise value of 61 crores is uh, arrived now since this is an enterprise ebitda multiple interest is not considered as an expenditure therefore you arrive at an enterprise value from enterprise value as we had seen earlier in the in income approach under dcf method all the loan funds the preference share capital all of it needs to be reduced and since this is operating a bit tough, the investments and the cash needs to be added separately to arrive at the equity value of the company. Any questions over here till now for the market approach? Okay, I'll move on to the cost approach. So under the cost approach, as I said, there is this net asset value method wherein it is nothing but your total assets less your total liabilities other than your equity share capital and your reserves and surplus. So, however, there is a replacement uh, value method or a realizable value method. So, what do you mean by replacement value? It is a cost of a new asset. If you were to re replace the asset to its similar condition today of an equivalent utility, wherein you have depreciated the value for the obsolescence today that is the value of that is the replacement value today so today you have a 15 year old plant which is there the cost of generating a similar uh, plant would be say 1000 rupees however since it is 15 years old you would depreciate it for the condition uh, you know which is wherein it is there today Plus, it is also depreciated for the obsolescence because there could be some technologies during this past 15 years which could have made a few processes or few uh, few processes obsolete. So, you tend to discount it a little more because uh, today that 
process if needs to be followed there are other ways wherein you know the production could be improved in a better way the efficiency could be higher so you depreciate that uh, the value for the obsolescence which could be there in today and what is the realizable value of the asset is today if you were to sell off or dispose of the asset and pay the tax if no the notional tax which could be there which could either be the short term or the long term and you also need to consider the time which it would take to sell off those assets. So if today I decide to liquidate the company, it may not happen that tomorrow I'll be able to sell off all the assets and realize the value of all the assets which are there. It will take its own time. You may take the help of some broker. You may have to sell it as a whole company or you may have to sell each and every asset separately and each of the asset may take its own time and there would be a tax on each of those sales. So that's where, you know, the realizable value of the asset is the value which is generally considered for liquidation, the companies which are there into liquidation and replacement value asset gives you a broad check about the buy versus the make approach, wherein today, whether under income approach, basis the profitability, the value which I'm paying. And if I was to consider a, a, a creating a replica of this asset, Okay, based on the similar condition, what is the additional premium which one has to consider? So this is the example of you know net assets value method wherein uh, all the assets minus the liabilities which are there and on a specific balance sheet date have been reduced. Plus you add the appreciation which is there in the value of investments because not necessarily all of your investments could have been accounted at fair value. You reduce the preference share capital because you are you are trying to value the equity share capital and you reduce the prob probable outflow which could be there on account of the contingent liabilities. So what you are then arriving at is the equity value of the company. You divide it by the outstanding number of equity shares, you arrive at the net asset value. So what are the common adjustments which one needs to consider? So those are the market value of investments as I, as I just said that you may be holding shares of a listed company or an unlisted company for many years but today the uh, it's accounted in the books at its cost however the fair market value of those investments could be substantially be different from your cost of acquisition so you adjust for the appreciation or the diminution which would be there for the value of those investments you adjust the value for the non-operating or the surplus assets so there could be, you know, that you had surplus funds, you bought a big land parcel and you have kept it for your future, you know, uh, business perspective. So today, you know, that that uh, uh, land parcel is not being used at all and it is just parking of your funds today. So you need to add this, the market value of that uh, surplus land parcel to your business value because that is... Today, even if that land parcel is sold, it does not affect your business operations at all or your growth, uh, growth which is budgeted for your projections. So those kind of surplus assets, you know, uh, could uh, the, val the fair value thereof needs to be added to the business value. There could be a lot of times wherein the cash is, uh, you know, staying in the business. It is not being cashed out by way of dividend or further investment opportunity. So those are all your surplus cash which needs to be added. Contingent liabilities, I've already explained that uh, you know, those there could be a lot of liabilities disputed, say maybe income tax demand, the uh, GST demand, or claims by uh, third parties against the company and all, which are reported by way of contingent liability. So there could be some probable cash outflows on that. So you need to check uh, in terms of the litigation at which stage is it, what has been the lower authorities' judgment, whether it has been in your favor or it has been in the favor of the third party, and accordingly take a judgmental call on those and what could be the probable outflow which could delve on the company uh, in future. So those also needs to be reduced from the value. You reduce the preference share capital because you are arriving at the equity value. And then there are a lot of dilutive instruments which the companies could have issued, say by way of uh, ESOPs to the employees, wherein you know they could in future maybe exercise, it, uh, exercise their uh, option to you know convert that option into equity at a certain exercise price okay so those may lead to your stake being diluted wherein the employees exercise their option similarly warrants could have been issued to the promoter 
so, uh, and, uh, you know they can exercise their right and maybe the stake of you, uh, you the, the the stake could get diluted and then there are a lot of com convertible instruments which a company can issue which is say optionally or compulsorily convertible so if those are compulsorily convertible you have to look at the conversion terms and accordingly consider or derive arrive at a value per share after considering those value shares if those are optionally convertible you have to make calls in terms of whether it makes uh, financial uh, you know sense to convert it into equity or to redeem it and accordingly you know kind of take the impact whether to reduce it as a liability or to consider conversion of those in convertible instruments there may be a lot of tax concessions which the company may get and the tax concession may not be forever but it may have a sunset so over the next few years if there are going to be any tax concessions what is the benefit thereof in terms of the next few years? The present value of that needs to be added separately to the value of the business. So these are kind of the common adjustments which one needs to consider. And how do you select from each of those approaches? Which are the best approaches for valuation? So this is broadly a sense of if you are valuing a knowledge-based company, the income approach and the market approach are generally considered because Cost has, the asset approach is not necessarily uh, required. So knowledge com based companies could be the likes of software companies wherein they could operate from lease premises. So the investment in capital is very negligible. And what matters for them is the income and uh, uh, income earning potential of those companies based on the employee resource which they have. And, employee resource, and employees are not accounted uh, under the asset approach that is the book value approach. So manufacturing companies, you can use a combination of the income which the company could earn, the market price at which, or the comparable transactions at which, uh, you know, uh, the stocks generally trade at. And you may also give a certain weight to the asset approach because for manufacturing companies, you need to invest a lot in the capacity building uh, for the infrastructure. For brand driven companies, for startup companies, you can use a combination of income and market approach. Again, for such companies, asset approach may have little relevance for limited life project only income approach is required to be considered because at the end of your limited life uh, you know the company is not going to earn its income and what do you mean by limited life project those could be say a toll collection company wherein you do you have built up a road and you get a right to collect toll only for say next 15 years or so after 15 years you have to hand over the road to the government back and thereafter you will not earn any revenue so that's where income approach that means the cash flows only till the residual life till the time in which you could collect the toll is uh, uh, you know what you need to consider you could have investment companies or property companies which invest or the, which are not into any other business but other than just investing and uh, trying to earn dividend or uh, interest income from the investments and also try to earn the capital appreciation from there. So the source companies are valued uh, based on the asset approach wherein the investments are fair valued. And there could be companies which are going for liquidation and for such companies income or market approach makes no sense. So whatever is the value which one would realize by selling off or disposing of those assets is what needs to be considered under companies going for liquidation. So what could be the other value drivers for valuation? It all depends on the strategic positioning and the illiquidity discount. What do you mean by strategic positioning is how, if, if there is a, what in which stage of the business cycle are you placed in? So if you are at it at the right time, uh, you are the first, you have the first movers advantage. If the business is going to boom and you already have an infrastructure, which is in place, you have the resources in place the company will get an additional premium because someone will just be able to take benefit of the growth which is now going to come for the company and the others may take time to set up the facility, get, uh, you know, earn the profits thereafter. Illiquidity discount, obviously for unlisted companies, you take a discount because uh, you will not be able to uh, sell the shares at a click of a button. You may have to put in a lot of efforts. You may have to uh, find brokers or someone to sell off your shares of an unlisted company. Emerging markets have a lot of growth potential as compared to the developed economies. So the, so the growth multiple is higher, thereby the value opportunity is higher. What could be the alternate opportunity 
uh, for using the assets which uh, the company is uh, currently using it also uh, um, you know leads to the value conclusion which one may have to consider if there is a distressed sale you know there is a pressure on the seller you know that he has to liquidate his investments uh, very soon he may have to consider some kind of a discount because he is not in a position to command and wait till the time you know he gets a suitable or right buyer and at the same time a control premium is considered wherein you know if you are already at say 20 25% uh, sorry if you are going to acquire a significant stake whereby you have a control over the operations you are willing to pay a premium rather than just being a shareholder with negligible a percentage holding into a company and not having any right to exercise any control so a control premium comes when you get a significant stake in the company and you thereby could command the control of the operations and again after having considered all of the other value drivers the final price is a result of the negotiation so there are no fixed parameters for each of those uh, factors or the drivers which we just discussed it is all at the end of the day of uh, how you negotiate the how the negotiations go on between the buyer and the seller <clears throat> Now, coming to the broadly, what are the issues which one can face uh, in valuation is the availability of information. Not every time you have access to all of the information which you may seek. At times, the transaction needs to be valued based on the information which is available in public domain and not necessarily everything which you want for a fair valuation in terms of the detailed valuation is available. So you have to make assumptions and presumptions from the information which is available. What is the sustainability and scalability of the business model means the company could have projected that, you know, they, they would grow at a, a higher rate over the next 10, 15 years. However, whether that business model at which they are planning to grow, is it sustainable and whether, you know, you can scale up that business so, so fast and without a, uh, you know, a significant investment in capital expenditure that also needs to be checked. Then there are this thinly traded and dormant script, you know, whether to what extent you should give weightages to the market price methods under those approaches. How do you evaluate a startup company? Because the startup companies have a past wherein, you know, they could be continuously be incurring losses. However, the projections could be very rosy in terms of, and it could be very aggressive because there is a market which could be there, but to what extent they will be able to penetrate and turn it into a profitable business, thereby commanding a value. Uh, there are a lot of international companies which could be in geographies wherein, you know, you may not have a full idea about that business or, uh, you know, the industries, the, the geography is such that not everything is uh, reported, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, in a better manner, you do not have good corporate governance over there or the regulations are not that strict wherein you know the finances do come up with a lot of disclosures. So there is, uh, to what extent do we rely on such uh, financials also? Then there is an issue in terms of the selection of the method wherein few of the companies, you, uh, they, they, you may not find a comparable company or you could not find comparable transaction with uh, information which could be there uh, publicly available to derive a comparable transaction multiple. So how do you consider uh, 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 multiple methods for such companies? Then there could be an illiquidity discount and a control premium. There are no fixed standard rules which tells you that, you know, uh, to what extent an illiquidity discount or a control premium needs to be considered in terms of percentage. Today, I may apply a 15% discount to the multiple for illiquidity, but that, uh, tomorrow, um, at the same time, you can consider a 20 or a 25% discount for illiquidity. So how do you determine exactly what percentage should one consider for an illiquidity? At the same time, if I'm going to get a control over the business operation, what should be the additional premium which I should consider as a control premium? That too, I'm not sure. Due diligence issues is something wherein you know, a lot of transactions get stuck wherein, you know, uh, when they do the due diligence, at that time, they get a lot of information regarding the company and those then needs to be factored in the valuation. And not necessarily during the due diligence, initial due diligence or limited to due diligence. All of the information which the company would want may be shared by the company because due diligence, it is an initial stage of due diligence and uh, the deal has not yet been executed. 
So that's where not all of the information may be shared by the company being evaluated. So now, you know, once you have arrived at the valuation, how do you report it? And what is the documentation work which uh, a registered valuer needs to be done, uh, needs to have it is what I'm going to now cover. So uh, a valuer in the valuation report, you know, the following is the minimum which should be uh, coming out in the report, which is the background information about the company or the asset which is being valued. Who is the appointing authority, whether it is the investor, whether it is the company itself, which is appointing you and why have they appointed you? What is the purpose of the valuation? The identity of the valuer needs to be put down. And they should give a disclosure that the valuer should not have any conflict or interest in the company being evaluated. The report should mention the date of the appointment at uh, the valuation date because the as Sir had mentioned earlier that valuation is subject to the date on which it is being valued. So valuation date needs to be provided in the report and the date of the report is the date on which the report is being signed. What were the inspections or investigations which were undertaken while carrying out the valuation and what, what was the nature and the sources from where the information were used and basis which the valuation was carried out. The report should also provide the procedures which one needs to, uh, which one had adopted in carrying out the valuation. What were the valuation standards which were followed? What were the valuation methodologies which were used? Now the report may necessarily uh, should be only addressed to and it should be relied upon and taken into consideration only by the client who has appointed you. So the restriction on the use of the report should specifically mention that this is only for the client to which it has been issued and for the purpose for which the report had been obtained. It cannot be used by anyone else other than the client who had appointed you. What were the major factors that were taken into consideration uh, while carrying out the valuation? It should have the conclusion detailed and the caveats, limitations and disclosure should also be provided very briefly and uh, you know it should not limit the responsibility of the report. However, in the, uh, the IBBI in September 2020 had announced the guidelines on the use of caveats, limitations and disclaimers by registered valuers in the valuation report which restricted you know the uh, the which did not limit the responsibility of the report. So the valuer could not just get away by putting caveats and limitations and disclaimers in the report and get away from the responsibility uh, and the uh, responsibility with which the valuation needed to be carried out. So there are restrictions on and guidelines on the use of such limitations which a registered valuer can put in a RV report. And these are the broad documentation which one needs to have in place. There should be an engagement letter between the client and the uh, valuer. It should mean <clears throat> whatever data one valuer has obtained during the course of valuation, it all needs to be documented. The valuation workings, however they carried out, you need to have a, not only a soft copy but a physical copy too, preferably for the valuation workings, detailing how the valuation process and the workings were carried out. The copies of relevant circulars and extracts of legal provisions at that point in time always helps you to keep the uh, files, uh, you know, in terms of at that point in time, if you're referring to a valuation three to five years down the line, what were the regulations or relevant circulars at that point in time, if you have it ready in those folders or in files, that helps you look at the regulations which were there at that point in time. The, what were the basic approaches and the methods used when you had carried out the valuation? The assumptions a change in which may materially affect the value. So what were the critical factors or the, uh, you know, which could impact the valuation should be narrated in the, uh, uh, you know, documents. A copy of the signed report, which is being issued to the client, obviously should form part of your filing procedures. And the most important document for a valuer is also the management representation letter, which they receive. This le representation letter gives you all the information regarding the company basis on which the valuation has been carried out. So these are the kind of broad documentation which a valuer needs to have. So uh, this is the end of presentation in terms of whatever we had to cover. I'll now uh, pause for a second for any questions. If uh, someone has, I'll take those.
and if not i will pass it on to sujil bhai uh, for his concluding remarks thank you so i think so uh, there are no questions which are being uh, posed right now so i'll hand it over to sujil bhai for his concluding remarks sir uh, i believe we have little less time so i will just take 2 3 minutes only yes sir uh, i think after uh, understanding from vitang about the various methodologies adjustments different uh, you know uh, uh, documentation requirements couple of points on how to be a good valuer so uh, what <clears throat> uh, one point which comes to my mind is that uh, technology has come to the help of the valuer uh, at a lot, uh, you know at a great extent by giving data at a uh, click of a button but we should as a valuer not become slaves of technology many times we use technology to to an extent whereby we don't even cross check the results so sometimes formulas are wrong so that while doing cut and paste we should be extremely careful one point which comes to my mind second is invest some time in reading the recent transactions because once you analyze the recent transaction you will as i mentioned earlier also you will get a lot of insight about the uh, you know how the corporates evaluate a particular asset and how they deal with them and that that will give you a lot of interest in the subject another important point at, at every conference which is uh, you know uh, which is very important is which are the valuation books which one should you you know read i think one classic book which i can think of is our uh, chamber of tech consultants book on valuation which is an evergreen uh, you know uh, sort of uh, document which is available at uh, uh, chambers office i'm not sure whether we are still left with copies but it is one very good book Uh, uh, the, and apart from that, from an international perspective, there is a book by McKinsey on the discounted cash flow method, also which which is uh, you know extremely good. Uh, another point which we should uh, keep in mind is that many times when we use these multiples, either EBITDA multiple or any of these uh, uh, other parameters, many times we use ready-made softwares like Bloomberg or Capitaline. our experience and vitang will also vouch for it that sometimes this data is not fully correct because they there you know it has been mechanically calculated so it is always better to cross check the results which these softwares give uh, from actual data to make sure that you don't make some uh, material mistakes another important point which uh, comes to mind my mind is that many times when we get the data from client and there are lots of discussions which are oral in nature when you discuss some very important parameters it always keep better to keep notes on such assumptions and uh, if required you can also make a minutes of those discussions and keep it for your file purpose purposes after getting confirmation from the client because tomorrow if your valuation is challenged at, at any regulatory level you will be able to defend yourself because some information or some explanation may have come to you on a oral basis uh most important point which next point which we should keep in mind is the files management see as vitang mentioned there are so many documents now it happens that suppose i am involved in a valuation assignment after 2 years i am not in the organization but and the inquiry may come after 3 years now at that time what will help the organization will be the file which is prepared for that assignment file should be the speaking file rather than uh, keeping any data in the minds of the person who have handled those assets because, because it is possible that that person is not available with you or he is busy during those days and investigation comes so the file should be a speaking file and very uh, well elaborated file so many times it may be a better thing that you know some for some specific subjective calls as a valuer what you have taken uh, you may keep proper file notes and keep it in your file rather than keeping that in, uh, you know explanation in your mind because after sometimes you would have handled another 50 assignments you will forget the uh, crux of the discussion which could have taken place um and finally uh, the as vitang mentioned about the report now see what happens all this exercise all your analysis everything finally uh, comes down to the report which you are you are issuing that becomes a your deliverable and that becomes your 
sticking point for the, uh, you know in front of client in front of regulators so your report writing skill has to be extremely good whatever points you want to convey or caution the reader of the report you must write it very clearly at times what we follow is that suppose i want some particular attention to be drawn to a, to the reader of the report which is very relevant for the valuation we put that in bold and italics so that the person who is reading the report gets the attention of it many times what we do is while we conclude when we give the conclusion in a report we repeat some repeat some important adjustments which have taken place to arrive at this conclusion because the reader of the report must know that you have arrived at this conclusion by so and so four four five important adjustments so whatever is relevant you may repeat at the conclusion paragraph so that whatever point you want to stress upon gets uh, you know uh, proper highlighting these were few of the points which i thought were relevant for one to become uh, you know a relevant and uh, good valuer it's a learning exercise throughout the life nobody can claim that he or she is an expert on the subject i consider this subject uh, keeps us keeps us in the student category for life so it's a it's a excellent uh, subject and uh, you know it keeps your bra uh, brain activated throughout uh, uh, your career so i still recommend strongly that if you are not into this practice or you are not uh, att attempted this uh, area please do get into this field it's a very interesting field thank you so much niyati charmi akash and uh, uh, others and as usual thank you vitang vitang helped me in all my assignments very ably so i was very confident that if vitang is the uh, you know one down batsman i don't need to worry so thank you so much to vitang also thank you thank you sir thank you so much sir it thank was you so really insightful and captivating it was true. it was indeed a master class today on valuation yes, thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sujal, sir, for giving your valuable time and Vitang for elaborating the session. Uh, Sujal, sir, uh, perfectly said that Vitang, you were the best batsman for the our orientation course also. So now for formally giving a vote of thanks, I request Akash to take the podium. Uh, hello, everyone. As uh, already vote of thanks has been done, this is just a formal vote of expression that on behalf of the student I am blissful to thank you, CA Sujal Chasar and CA Vitang Chasar, for conducting this insightful session. And as ma'am, uh, Neerthi ma'am, as I already said, that though the name of the session was Valuation Overview, but this was definitely an in depth workshop where, along with different valuation methodologies, other aspects were also covered. Uh, this session has definitely uh, helped the participants to better understand the topic. Thank you, Sujal sir, and thank you. Vitang sir, I would also like to thank all the participants for their active participation and asking the questions in the chat box. And I urge the participants to join the tomorrow's session, which is on BST landscape best practices for returns and compliances, which will be held at 30 p.m. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.